Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you here. My name is Sarah Bollinger. Uh, this is uh, my band, The B-Sides. <laughs> we we uh, normally uh, worship at uh, The Gathering at their 6 p.m. service, so we're so pleased to be here and share in worship with y'all. Um, we usually do worship in the evening, so this is a change for us. Um, let's all stand up. We're going to get started with worship. Um, this first song is called Our God, and I just encourage you guys to sing along. Have you heard this song before? Our God. Okay, so you can sing loud and proud. Um, yeah, and I, I really just want to take this opportunity this morning just to spend time together uh, centering our hearts, focusing on how awesome our God is, what he's doing in our lives, and, uh, and then, you know, kind of lead into to hearing um, more about how we can share that, that awesome awe and wonder with the world. So, uh, yeah, hope it's, hope it's good.
just says, I am set free, I am set free, I am set free, and it's just um, kind of a, basically sings that song, it was for freedom, that Christ set us free, and I hope you guys join in in singing, it's, uh, it just really captures exactly what God did in our lives. You broke my chains of sin and shame, and you covered with grace you mend my life with your holy fire you cover me with grace you are the hand that reaches out to say I am saved Sing it again. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time together, for all that you're doing in our hearts and lives and churches. Um, God, we thank you for the freedom that you've given us, uh, for the grace, for setting us free to do your work, to be partners with you in this kingdom. Would you teach us today? Would you open us? Would you reveal new things? Would you be present here? Thank you, Lord, for this time together, and we just uh, give the rest of the day to you. Amen. You all can be seated. Are we on? Can we give it up for Sarah Bollinger and the B-Sides? <laughs> These folks are absolutely amazing. Every time I hear uh, Sarah and her crew sing, um, there is a spirit that wells up inside of me. I, <laughs> it's just hard to explain. And so we thank you for setting the tone for us this morning. Uh, besides. Um, I want to do just a few minutes of quick housekeeping. I am Jeff Baker from the Missouri Annual Conference. I'm the Director of Mission Service and Justice um, for our conference here in Missouri. We have 850 churches, uh, Methodist churches across the state. Uh, we do cover the entire state uh, in that conference. And one of the roles of our office is to support local congregations to, uh, to go out into the world and make disciples. And we feel like today uh, is exactly what our call is in, in all of the work that we do. And it's to bring people to you, uh, and it doesn't matter what denomination or non-denomination or non-church you're a part of, uh, what Bob Lupton is going to share with us today is applicable to every single one of us. And we're excited to have him here with us. Um, we are going to show a short video, and I'm going to allow uh, somebody else to introduce that, but I want to do just a couple of housekeeping things with us. I would ask that if you would just double check your phone to make sure it is on stun instead of uh, uh, let everybody else in the world know that you've got a phone call. That would be awesome. Um, you had, uh, we had some small agendas outside at, at the table. If you didn't get one uh, and need one, uh, we have a pretty simple agenda for the day. We're going to meet here this morning, um, and uh, about 9.30, we're going to get Bob up here to, to, to get us rolling, um, uh, and then he's going to go until 11 o'clock, and then we're going to break for lunch, and I know that's probably an early lunch for everybody, um, but the church here at Manchester has, uh, uh, has fixed us a, a delicious lunch, and so we're going to just go straight out these doors and right across the hall. Um, and there's tables set up, and so we'll just stream in there, grab a lunch. Our, our time frame is a, a bit restricted. We only have about 45 minutes, so we want to be efficient in that. Um, and, then, uh, uh, and then we're going to meet back in here at, um, at 1145, and Bob is going to start session two with us. And then uh, at the end of session two, at 115, we're going to take a 15-minute break. And I would ask that each time that we take a break today that we try to respect our time frame because we are really trying to, to I, we're, what we're doing is asking you guys to drink from a fire hose. And so um, 
uh, that's gonna that's a lot of work, um, but but we want to give Bob as much time as as we can to share his message with us. Uh, and, and so then at at one thirty, then we're gonna go back across the hall, and we're gonna sit around tables because Bob is gonna have us doing some hands on. Uh, practical pieces where we're actually talking with people for, that we might have come with or sharing some ideas and kind of developing what he shared with us in the first two sessions. And at 3 o'clock, Bob is going to finish up. He's going to come outside um, and then do a book signing for 30 minutes. And I'm sorry if everybody will not have an opportunity, but at 3.30, uh, Bob and I are jettisoning to the airport so that Bob can get home tonight. Uh, I do not want to be responsible for Bob being uh, late and missing his flight and TSA giving him the shakedown this afternoon. So um, so at 3.30, uh, kind of wherever we're at, we're going to have to grab Bob and pull him out of here. Um, but uh, uh, we appreciate him taking some time at the end of the day to, to uh, sign books for us. Um, Melissa, you want to come on up here and... and um, we're going to inter let you introduce our video for us and uh, give us a little bit of history, and then we're going to get rolling with the day. Um, before I do that, I, would, I have got to say thanks. Anybody in these red shirts, if you all would hold your hands up, if you're from the, the church here with a red shirt on today, um, thank you all so much uh, from Manchester United, uh, United Methodist. Um, uh, Stephanie Lent and, and um, uh, Carolyn Langston have work like crazy. Uh, Greg Weeks, the pastor, is in the back there. Can you raise your hand for us? Thank you so much uh, for, for giving us this space today to, to hold this event, and um, uh, we appreciate everything everybody has done. Will met with us on his day off last night, our AV guy. Um, so thank you all so much uh, for everything that you all have done to help bring all of this together, and I would be remiss if I didn't shout out to my own office at Creative Ministries. Um, everybody there has worked like crazy uh, to pick up the pieces where I would just throw an idea out and they'd actually do it. So um, I, I give them thanks for everything that they're doing. So um, if there are no questions, uh, there's some hospitality stuff. If you need a glass of water or something to, to snack on, there's some bottles of water outside. There's some restrooms right outside. Um, look for somebody in a red, red shirt. They'll get you fixed up. And let's kick this thing off. Good morning. Uh, hi, my name is Melissa Jackson Burns. I actually live just up the highway in Columbia, Missouri, and I am studying for a PhD in theater right now. And over the summer, I wanted to get started bringing theater into the church um, and seeing what could happen. So I sat down with my reverend and said, what could I uh, write a scene about? What do you need? And she said that she was reading two books, and one of those books was Toxic Charity. So I went and I got both books, and I read them, and I worked on writing a scene. And um, you will be seeing that scene today, and you'll see somebody who has a need, and you'll see some different responses to this need. And some of them might be a little bit problematic, and um, you'll have to decide for yourselves what is the problem, what are the problems with how we're responding to this need. Um, it is an allegory, so it's open to interpretation. And um, at the end of the day, you're going to see that same skit redone a little bit. Um, Jeff asked me to write a second version of it in which the characters would take the principles from Toxic Charity and apply them to this situation, so I did my best and tried to come up with what I thought that would look like with the same characters responding in a different way. So you will get to see that at the end of the day, and um, I hope you that the video uh, gives you some good food for thought today, and uh, that is all I have for you. everyone. How is everyone's evening? Good. Mm -hmm. uh, who are we missing? Just Larry and Steph. Oh, well, it's all right. We still have a few minutes. 
and you know how that congregation is. Has everyone done the reading from Toxic Charity and When Helping Hurts? I'm almost finished. I've taken notes, and I've got some ideas for allocation of funds. You know, I found the reading quite interesting, mm -hmm. and it gave me some good ideas, too. Good. I brought some discussion questions, so when Larry and Steph get here, we can begin and go over the questions. Sorry, I'm late. Work ran a little long. No, it's fine. You're right on time. It looks like almost everyone is here. Larry, did you do the reading? Uh, work's been uh, crazy. I plan on catching up over the weekend. Okay. Alex, did you finish the reading? Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Steph can catch up when she gets here. We'll need to break up into pairs and... <clears throat> um, Delia, uh, would you mind if maybe we started with a prayer? Oh, of course. Would anyone like to pray us in? I'll pray us in. Great. Let's join hands. Sorry I'm late, everyone. Oh, were we about to pray? <gasps> I found this really great prayer on this website for Methodist liturgy. It's all about giving and sacrifice. Seemed appropriate. Oh, well, Chris was about to pray us in. Chris? I, I guess you could use it to pray us out? Well, should we get started with the prayer? I've got to leave early tonight for a work meeting. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight and pray for your guidance. We pray that we may be servants for you, helping those you put in our path. Please help us to recognize those opportunities to serve others and to give of ourselves. We pray that you bless our meeting tonight that we may be fruitful in the task that you have set for us. We thank you for your loving assurance and providing this ladle to us, that we may always have a drink. For without your loving blessings, we would have no ladle and no way to drink this water. Please help us to take the blessings you have given us and spread them to all of creation. In your Son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. All right, let the second meeting of the Community Stewardship Outreach Team of the Greater Boone County area and surrounding municipalities come to order. I have some discussion questions to get us started. Shouldn't we just jump right in and talk about funds? We have a lot of decisions to make and not a lot of time. Well, that's true, Steph, but I think these are really good discussion questions. Um, hello. Oh, hello. Uh, may we help you? Oh, I'm thirsty. I just came for a drink. This is a meeting of the Community Stewardship Outreach Team of the Greater Boone County area and surrounding municipalities. Did you have a business item to introduce to our meeting? I thought this was a closed meeting. I was reading some bylaws for other committees, and sometimes they allow outside people to come in. Well, I'm okay with someone joining our meeting. Uh, it could pr provide a fresh perspective, huh? W would you like to join us? I'm just thirsty. Well, you need to use the ladle. We always use the ladle. Yes, the ladle. We all use it? It's the only way to get a drink. The only, the only way. way. So, help yourself. We should pair up for discussion questions. I still think we should get straight to discussing funds. I made notes. Reading? What? The discussion questions can start us off about talking about what we should use our funds for to best help those in need. I like it. Um, I have to leave early, but I'll put my two cents in now. You know, I have some scripture passages that might shed some light on the subject of helping. Here we go. We could also read the scripture about taking care of widows. Excuse me. It seems like a practical approach would be most effective. Excuse me. Can someone please help me? Excuse me. It, excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm thirsty, but I can't reach the ladle. We are having a meeting of the Community Stewardship Outreach Team of the Greater Boone County Area and Surrounding Municipalities. I'm not sure how we can help you. I thought we had a water intern. You know, we, we did used to have one, but I think she graduated last May. Really? She graduated? But we do have a program with volunteers. Um, here, I have a brochure you might be interested in. Um, you can just look it over and come back next Tuesday and let me know what you think. But I'm thirsty now. Alex, do you have any ideas? Huh? She's thirsty and she can't reach the ladle. Well, 
someone please help me? I'm thirsty and... Deaf? Don't look at me. Why don't you get a step ladder and help yourself? Do you know where I could find one? Can we please just get back to the meeting? We're really wasting time now. Uh, can't we do something? Chris, she'll be fine. There's plenty of water. This is America. But she's thirsty, and maybe she doesn't qualify for free water. That isn't our problem. There are plenty of places to go for water. We have a lot to cover, and I made notes. I'll help her. According to Toxic Charity, giving only creates dependency. You know, I think you're skipping over some other ideas in that book. I never give out free water. May I please have some more? Sure, sweetie. <sighs> more? I, I'm sorry. I, I have a meeting. I have to go. I'm thirsty. May I please have more to drink? Sorry, she's so thirsty. I helped her to Besides, I think it's your turn. I'm still thirsty. Will someone please help me? I wrote notes on the part of the reading that has to do with missions. Will we be, will we be discussing missions? Surely we could get another water intern. We should start a committee for getting a water intern. Or maybe one of those robotic label ladles that serves you automatically. <laughs> do you have any idea how much robotic ladles cost? Now, can we get started with our meeting? If she can't have water, then I'm not going to have any either. I'll just go thirsty, too. You know, I, I think I have a solution. You know, I understand what you're going to. I'm pretty thirsty as well. So, we'll go to the office, and we'll arrange for transport for you to a church down the street. And I'm sure they have plenty of water there, and maybe an intern, right? So, I'll just... Um, I'm pretty sure their intern quit. Now, I'm sure you'll find them much more accommodating. Well, I'm glad that's taken care of. You know, I wish there was some way we could help. Let's get back to the meeting. Here, I have some discussion questions for us. <clears throat> How can we recognize and address the needs of others? I have a feeling that we're going to do a lot of good. Bob, you're up. Thank you. What an intro. It's a, uh, it's a joy to be with you. Uh, how many of you are uh, Methodists? Oh, this is a Methodist crowd. Isn't it? <laughs> Makes me feel so good. Uh, I married a Presbyterian. And uh, life just hasn't been the same. But my dad was a... Methodist minister, so this feels like coming home. Today, uh, we want to have a good bit of time uh, for interaction. Uh, some of the things that we'll be discussing could be, uh, could be a little troubling, a little puzzling, uh, but uh, we'll have time to for, uh, interact, and uh, both uh, a roving mic here as well as uh, over in the uh, cafeteria where we'll, we'll have lunch today. So uh, if, if I happen to say anything that you don't particularly agree with, well, uh, don't just sit on it. Go ahead and fire it away, and we can, we can discuss it, and I'll, I'll show you how you're, you're wrong. Forty. Uh, Two years ago, this morning, I was in the jungles of Vietnam. I assumed that it would be the most wasted year of my life. That was the conflict of the day. And uh, 
in those days they, they had a draft. And uh, if you didn't have a college deferment, uh, you were just kind of scooped up and sent over there. And so I found myself surrounded with uh, all kinds of uh, kids with issues, inner city kids, rural kids without education, dropouts, that had, they brought certain, they brought issues with them uh, from their environment. And then what made it worse was that the, the drugs there were, were very cheap and very pure. And so those kids got strung out pretty quickly. And I found myself surrounded with, with kids that had issues. And so uh, I started working with them, helped some of those kids uh, get their high school GEDs and uh, helped set up an amnesty drug abuse program for those kids that were trying to get off drugs before they came back to the States, even set up college courses for some of that graduated from high school and started taking steps into higher education. So what I thought would be the most wasted year of my life uh, turned out to be a very pivotal year in my life. It was uh, God used that experience to, to place within my heart a, uh, a desire to help troubled young men. And so when I came back and got out of the military and went back to my business career, uh, it didn't take very long before uh, a growing dissatisfaction with that track uh, began to grow in me. And uh, so I... Uh, I left my job and started a program uh, with the juvenile court uh, in Atlanta, working with kids on probation. Uh, and that really, that really became uh, my education. That's the, the start of my education into a whole world that I had very little knowledge of. Uh, it didn't take long to figure out that if you're going to work effectively with troubled kids, you've got to be involved with their families. And so I went back to school to learn how to work with families and uh, expanded our work to include the families of kids on probation, only to realize that if you're going to work effectively with struggling families, you had to be involved in the environment that impacted on them every time they step out of the door. And that pushed me to get more involved with what was going on in the street and in the schools and with the police. And I realized if, if, you're going to, if you're going to change an environment, the most effective way to do that is to enter into that environment and, and change it from the inside out. That's... Uh, not an insight that one shares quickly with one's wife. <laughs> Particularly when you're building your new dream home a little farther out in the suburbs, a little closer to our church. Uh, and so I didn't. I kept that to myself. And uh, about five weeks before we were ready to move into our new house, uh, that was the high energy uh, time when you're picking out the, the carpet and the cabinetry and the light fixtures. And I remember when it happened, we had gone to bed early and Peggy just wanted to talk, my wife. She just wanted to talk. And I said, I don't think you want to talk to me tonight. And she said, oh no, what's wrong? And I said, I don't think God wants us moving farther out the suburbs. I think he wants us moving into the inner city. That was a bad night. <laughs> In the morning, Peggy says, is this your idea or God's idea? Because if it's your idea, I'm not interested at all. She said, I want it in writing. From God, if I could get it, you know. So I did. It was the first time I articulated this sense of calling. I wrote her a seven-page letter. And she took that around to her girlfriends and our small group leader and our pastors and, uh, and concluded that at least I believed that that was a call of God. And if it is a call of God, what choice do you really have? And so 
it's a, uh, it's a tribute to Peggy's spiritual maturity that she let go of her vision for her dream home in the suburbs where we'd raise our two boys in a safe environment and good schools and let go of that and move into the heart of one of the high crime areas in the heart of Atlanta. That's when things really began to change for us. Uh, not only as a family, uh, but also in the work that we were doing. That, that was about a 10 year learning curve for me. I'm sort of a slow learner. Uh, but we, we, when we moved into the community, uh, by that time, we had, a, we had a good number of good programs going. Along, along that 10-year period, I had gotten use of a, uh, an old Presbyterian church that had closed down in their city a, a church, and, and uh, so they let us use the building. And we started various uh, programs that churches typically do. We started a, uh, a food pantry and, and a clothes closet and uh, gathered neighbors in to start some worship. Uh, one, of the, one of the more exciting uh, efforts that uh, we initiated was what we called uh, Adopt a Family for Christmas. And so we would get the names of, of kids in our neighborhood, their ages, and uh, give those names to folks in the suburbs from churches that were supporting our work. Uh, and then they'd go shopping, they'd buy the toys for the kids and deliver those toys to their homes on Christmas Eve. And it, it created a, a lot of excitement. Uh, and so we did a lot of that. That was, a, that was a big event on our calendar. But the, the first Christmas that we were actually living in the neighborhood, that was the first time I really had any spare time uh, to be in the homes of some of the recipient families when the gift-bearing families arrived. And I, I saw something that I had never seen before. Uh, of course, the kids were all excited, jumping up and down. The moms were a little reserved, uh, maybe a little embarrassed. But if there was a dad in the household, he just disappeared. He was gone out the back door, and, and I realized what was happening was that these parents in front of their own children were being exposed for their inability to provide, and it was, it was hurting their pride. The moms would endure that indignity for the sake of the kids, but it was more than the dad, the, the manly pride can handle it. it was, as though their impotence was being exposed in front of their wives and kids in their own living rooms, and it was killing them. And I had never seen, I had never seen that, that underside of charity before, I, uh, and, it, and it disturbed me greatly. There was, uh, I was reading in those days, I was reading anything I could get a hold of uh, on uh, urban work and the city and urban ministry wasn't a lot printed in those days. But I came across one author, a French philosopher by the name of Jacques Ellul. And I was reading his book on the city, and there was a quote that, that jumped off the page at me and hit me right in the heart. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can get it up here. Ellul says, almsgiving is mammon's perversion of giving. It affirms the superiority of the giver. It binds him and demands gratitude. It humiliates him and reduces him to a lower state than he had before. Can you see why that hit me right in the heart? That was not what I was about. We moved in to be neighbors, to share life together, uh, to, to build a sense of community and trust and honest relationships. That's what we were about. 
and to realize that perhaps I was reducing to a lower state than before I came, those that I was there to help, that was very, very hard to hear. But I did see the humiliation. And I did expect gratitude. That now, uh, I, I, cloaked, I cloaked my uh, uh, sense of superiority in a, in a facade of humility. So I would certainly appear to be humble. But there is a superiority involved when you have the resources and you're the one controlling and, and, and doling them out. What Elul said just hit me in the heart. And I wondered, is this same kind of thing happening in our other programs that we have going here? And so I started one by one. I started looking at them honestly. I looked at uh, our clothes closet. Now that was, it was not hard to gather clothing from around the city. Uh, we don't wear out clothes in our culture, except the men, they tend to. Uh, but it's easy to pull clothes in, and we did that. We had churches help collect clothing, and we set up a room uh, in the church and uh, invited our neighbors to come. We said, we said, these are the free gifts of God's people. They've been freely given, freely received them. And the spirit of it was just beautiful until we actually opened the doors. And then folks came, came charging, and there's a, there's a sort of a, a sort of a I gotta get mine attitude that kind of crept in there, and folks were elbowing and grabbing as many clothes as, as they could stuff in as many bags and carry out. And, and then I'd find those clothes scattered around the community. They didn't have any place to try them on. And so we said, whoa, we've got to, we've got to put some rules down here. This is not very good stewardship. And so we did. We posted some rules. Limit the number of garments that you could get per visit. Limit the number of visits per month. Well, that was like saying, let the games begin. Can I get some garments for my kids that are in school? That's reasonable. Can I get some garments for my sick uncle? You see where it's going. In no time... We're behaving like temple police, guarding the resources of the kingdom against the very folks we were there to serve among. It set up an adversarial relationship. That wasn't what we had in mind. We had community in mind. We had sharing. We had bearing one another's burdens. That's what we had in mind. But the net effect of our, of our one-way giving produced just the opposite effects. The food pantry wasn't any better. Uh, we could never quite get that equitable. You know, somebody would somebody donate a dozen canned hams. Well, you got 50 people in line. How are you going to how are you going to give that out equitably? And some folks get pickled beets and somebody else gets canned corn and somebody's somebody's got some dissatisfaction. But they couldn't really express it because they had to, they had to expect, ex express gratitude. But just underneath the surface, there's this sense of, I, uh, they, these people, you've got to accept what they give you. And if you looked at the body language, you could see that it was not a, it was not a very affirming kind of process. Folks were uh, objects of pity accepting our charity. It was, not a, it was not what we had in mind. I noticed that there was a progression uh, in, in our giving, one-way giving. Um, if you give somebody something one time, uh, you elicit appreciation. Folks say, thank you. It's a, it's a surprise. It's a delight. Appreciate that very much. 
But, the time, but if you give somebody something two times, it starts to create a little bit of anticipation. Oh, I wonder if they're going to keep doing this. By the third time, you've created an expectation. When am I going to get mine? When's it coming? Folks are expecting it now. By the fourth time, it's become an entitlement. I don't want a turkey this year, I want a ham. It's an entitlement now. By the fifth time, it's dependency. You can't stop now. I'm counting on this. We're depending on you. It's a, it's a kind of a downwards progression or regression that moves from, from sharing and delight into a very unhealthy kind of, of dependency. And I saw it happening over and over again. I started realizing this kind of one-way giving doesn't empower people after all. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, it disempowers people. I had to admit that uh, this way of serving, this kind of charity was like Elul said, uh, it was diminishing dignity and leading to dishonest relationships. You weren't sure you were hearing the whole story. A little distrust in there, going the wrong direction. So we said, let's, let's just get out of this giveaway business. And so we said, from now on, we're only going to give uh, when there's a crisis. Whereupon the incidence of crises skyrocketed. <laughs> Everybody had a crisis. And we said, no, wait a second, wait a second. What's a real crisis? What, what's, a, uh, what's an emergency? And what's a function of, of chronic poverty? And so we said, we've got a, we've got a, decide what, uh, how, how we're going to exchange food or give out food and clothing, toys. Uh, a crisis situation demands an emergency response. That's exactly the right response. When a, when a tornado blows through, you know the right response. It's an emergency response. We get in there with, with food and clothing and shelter and medical supplies and so a, an emergency response, uh, demand, or an emergency demands a, an emergency response. That's the right response. A chronic need, on the other hand, demands a development response. Once the bleeding is stopped, once lives are saved, then it's time to start rebuilding. Rebuilding homes, rebuilding jobs, rebuilding schools and infrastructure, it's the time for rebuilding. You address a crisis need with a crisis intervention and lives are saved. That's, uh, th that is exactly the right response. But if you address a chronic need with an emergency or crisis response, people are harmed. Give you an example of that. I was uh, just two weeks ago. I was in New Orleans. I'd been in. Remember Katrina when Katrina hit, and we saw it every night on the news. People stranded on top of buildings and all. That was an emergency. That demanded. That was a demanded emergency response, and we did that as a nation. It was pretty messy, but but we did that, and a lot of us took families from. Uh, New Orleans and housed them and so it was an emergency response that was that was right that was about eight years ago now you know there are still groups going into New Orleans with food and clothing ministering to the victims of Katrina you get that victims created a, a victim class folks that are now dependent on folks bringing in emergency supplies when that emergency was gone seven years ago. 
if you address a chronic need, that's, a, that's chronic poverty, with an emergency response, you hurt people. And I realized that most of our interventions, most of our services were emergency responses to chronic issues. And that's why it was producing toxic results. So we said, we've gotta, we've gotta change this. We gotta change our thinking for one thing. Instead of seeing our low income neighbors as poor people that need our help, we said, we need to start seeing them as neighbors with capacity, with all kinds of abilities. And that no one in our community is so poor that they have nothing to bring, nothing to exchange. Nobody's that poor. Everybody has something. But it, it takes different eyes to start, to start recognizing that. What do you do with the homebound seniors that were in our community that, that could not get out anymore? Well, uh, they're the ones that look out the Venetian blinds on the street and they know what's going on out there. That's our crime watch. Those folks are on their, on their telephones talking to each other in the morning. How you doing, honey? How'd you wake up this morning? Let's pray together. That's your, that's your telephone network, your communication network in the community. If we start looking for the talents that are there, we find them. Young people, boy, they're rich with talents. And so if we think, how can we how can we enable them to contribute those talents to the life of the community? So one of our programs is a, a little performing arts program. Kids learn to dance, you know, and these little, little ones that are this high and they do cute little things, showstoppers, you know, love those. But as soon as they graduate up to the next level, we start them right away into working with those younger kids to teach them what they learned and on up and by the time you're uh, in uh, your senior years in high school, uh, you're, planning the, you're planning the trip, you're doing the choreography, you're, you're running the sound and the music. The, the responsibilities grow as the, as the capabilities of those young people grow. And, and they elect two of those young people every year to serve on the board of the organization. Uh, young people with abilities. Well, you've got to be looking, looking for potential instead of looking for need. Everybody's got something to contribute. And then we said we, we can't serve the whole south side of Atlanta. So we've got to narrow our focus. And we said, let's make a commitment to our particular neighborhood. And that means that we can begin to have some accountability in our relationships. Well, we get to know our neighbors. And so there's, a, there's a, a level of friendship, a level of accountability that enables us, uh, if we limit our scope, to know who we're interacting with. So that was an important decision. And then we adopted what I would call the golden rule of helpful service. And that is, Never do for others what they have the capacity to do for themselves. To do that is to disempower them. It's, it's to erode a work ethic. It's to diminish dignity. When you take on responsibility for doing something for somebody else, that they have the capacity to do for themselves. Now, it may take longer to do that, and it, uh, it, may be, it may be messier, and it might not be uh, a nice clean program that uh, you can run volunteers through, but uh, the, the results are far more positive. The development in the lives of those we are concerned about uh, is what can take place. So what do we do? Uh, that adopt a family at Christmas time, our adopt a family program. The following year, when uh, families called in to get their adopted family, we said, Would you give an extra gift this year? 
would you give the gift of dignity to the dads? And here's how you do it. Go shopping, buy the toys, don't wrap them. Bring them down to the community and we'll set up, we'll get a little storefront right across the street from the church and we'll call it uh, the old toy shop. And we'll put somewhere between a, uh, a wholesale and a garage sale price on those toys. And we'll invite our parents to come shopping. And if they don't have money, if they're unemployed, well, we're creating some cash flow here. That means that we can hire some of those parents. And they can go to work in the store and make the money that they need to buy toys for their kids. Then on Christmas morning, the parents in our community will have the same joy that most parents in the city have of seeing their children open the gifts that, that they have selected and purchased through the efforts of their own hands. And there will be dignity in the process of exchange. Well, that's kind of a quantum leap from uh, folks giving toys to kids to letting us sell toys. But when we explained, you know what kids really need more than toys for Christmas, they need effective parents. And we'll take the proceeds from those toys and we'll set up a training program so that we'll train those parents in skills that will support them in the economic ma mainstream, move, in, move them out into decent jobs that can support their families, so that that Christmas gift will just keep on giving all year long. And so when folks got that picture, they said, we'll do that. And that little toy store became a very bright spot in our community found out a couple things. One is that parents would a whole lot rather work to earn, to pick out that toy, those toys they know that would delight their kids, than they would stand in the free toy lines with their proof of poverty and accept the gift that somebody else decided their kids needed. They'd much rather do that. And another thing we found out, in this whole process, we, we tripped over a universal truth. Universal, I say, from all times in every culture. Everybody loves to find a bargain. When Peggy, uh, this past Christmas, she'd been out Christmas shopping for the day. And she came home and spread out her treasures around the living room for me to admire. And she said, and you know what? She said, I saved more than I spent. <laughs> now, now, you're going to have to, you know, I'm not an economist. Uh, so you're going to have to explain the economy of, 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 that, uh, of that, uh, those transactions. But you know what she was excited about? She was excited about finding bargains. It's universal. Why would we want to exclude the poor from the joy of finding bargains? Well, that clothes closet, uh, that, was, uh, that was a dilemma. Wasn't building trust. We were guarding against the very people that we said we were there to be neighbors among. So I was explaining uh, this dilemma to a Methodist men's group who had helped us collect clothing, telling them about it. And they said, well, there's a simple answer to that, Bob. You know, those that aren't there always have simple answers, <laughs> particularly Methodist men. I don't know what it is about <laughs> Methodist men. They said, yeah, there's a simple answer to that. It's called the market. You put a fair rate of exchange on a desired commodity, it cuts all that out. Really? Oh, yeah. I said, well, would you guys help us set that up? Well, they had a meeting. They said, yeah, we'll take that on as our, our men's missions project this year. And those guys set about doing what they can't help doing even in their sleep anyhow. You, you got to have a business plan. Traffic flow patterns. 
got to be on a bus line. Real estate research. Shop the competition. We got to bring this in right below the Goodwill Industries thrift store. They said, if we do it right, this thing will, this thing will break even in a couple of years. And if, if, we, if we do it right, we can be training folks in retail merchandising and move them out to Sears and, and Penny, Penny's and other, other stores out there. This can be a training program as well as affordable clothing. And he said, it takes, for a business startup, it's going to take a couple years. And they were absolutely right. It took 18 months for that little store to move into the black financially. And it's, it's never looked back. It's just been a bright spot in the community from that, from that point forward. It changed the dynamic instantly between that giver and recipient dynamic where you kind of have to guard against folks getting too much and merchant and customer where you need those customers and you want them to buy as much as they possibly can buy because you need the dimes and the dollars of, of your customer base. You need them because you've got payroll to make. You've got a light bill to make. They're needed. And I'll tell you what, you could see it instantly. It changed that dynamic totally. Now it's not a question of how do you get them how do you, how you keep them from getting too much? Now it's a question of how do we keep them coming back? And so our first group of trainees had the, had the chore of setting up what are, our, uh, what are the norms of our business that make customers feel welcome? And they said, well, you know, we need to get everybody's name. Now, some of the neighbors they knew, but a lot of them they didn't. But we got to get their names down and, and find out something about them, write that down so we can, so we can share it with each other. So when Miss Jones comes in to the store, they can say, good morning, Miss Jones. How are you doing this morning? How's your mama doing? People like to go where everybody knows their name. We could do a show on that, couldn't we? <laughs> the, uh, we jumped in the van and went out the shopping mall to look at these, these little clothing stores that they have out there. And, uh, take notes, and the debrief afterward was, was fascinating. They said, well, they were very friendly with us. Uh, when you first walked in, they had the latest fashion arrivals right there. And then they had big sales racks and big sales signs on them, and, and all the clothes were sized, and the hangers all went the same way. And one of the women said, yeah, you know, and the stores smell nice, too. You know when you're dealing with used clothing that sometimes there's a little, a little stale smell that goes with that. You can't dry clean them all. And so they were saying, how can we make our store smell better? And one of our trainees said, well, we could have a pot of fresh brewed coffee going in the morning. That would help. And another one said, yeah, if we did some microwave cookies, that would help. And so now you come walking into the store and the aroma of, of coffee and fresh baked cookies greets your nose. This is all about making folks want to come into your store. You see how different that is from the clothes closet that has to guard against people? We, we tripped across another universal truth, a, a gift of God. It's like one of, maybe it's one of God's most magical gifts to humanity. It's called the economy, and it is in every culture. This lady over here has, uh, she's got more tomatoes, a bumper crop of tomatoes than more than her family can eat this year. And, and this guy over here is, uh, he's grown, his corn crop is very good this year, more than his family needs. So they've got some surplus here. And they come to the bargaining table and they look at what each other has and they work out an exchange. And both of them go away feeling like they got more than they brought. 
That's magic. It's how every economy in the world works. That's why Peggy was so excited about coming home because she got more than she brought. Why do we think that the poor would not want to participate in a system of exchange? They do. It's a part of God's common grace, his gifts to all humanity, that we all have something to bring to the bargaining table. And it becomes a responsibility, I believe, of those of us who are, have some control and some stewardship over resources to figure out those systems of exchange where everybody wins. The food pantry, uh, we said we got to find a better, got to find a better way. And so one of our uh, staff guys had, uh, had heard about uh, a, a, an idea of a food co-op. He read up a little bit about it. And so uh, one, of the, one of our food days, he said, anybody here interested in a food co-op? And folks said, what is that? And he said, well, you put in three bucks, and then we take that over to the Atlanta Food Bank, and we can buy surplus food. We can buy... For that three bucks, probably thirty to fifty dollars worth of food, and there were a dozen women that said, "I'd be interested in that." And so we collected the money, put a little bit of the food, our, our own food pantry money, in that. Went to the food bank and came back with with an amazing amount of food, and those women were astounded. For three bucks, they got all this, and then the word got out, said, "That's a way to do this." And so our co-op. A uh, little, little group started to swell and get bigger. Uh, one of the first issues that came up uh, was uh, our staff guy was bringing home the wrong assortment of food. And so there was a little bit of discontent here. Why did he bring all those, I don't know, rutabagas or something? And so we said, well, elect a buyer. Just get somebody that you want to take your grocery list for you and have them do the, do the shopping. Well, that was the first organizational step that that little cluster of former food pantry, food pantry recipients had. And so that solved a problem. But the next issue that came up was uh, credit. What do you do if somebody doesn't have their three dollars this week? Do we carry them? Well, that wasn't our decision. That was, the, that was the decision of those that had the skin in the game, who had their three dollars at risk. And so that, uh, boy, that launched them into quite a, quite a lengthy and, and uh, intriguing discussion there. Uh, uh, who can we trust? And if they if they don't pay it back the next week, week when they say, how, how do we, do we cut them off, throw them out? So there's all these discussions. And in, uh, along the line, somebody, so they're writing down policies, right? Somebody says, somebody needs to be getting notes on this. Somebody needs to be writing this down. Well, that was their second organizational step. They elected a secretary. Write these things down. And then somebody said, who's going to tr keep track of who paid and who didn't and who paid back and we need a treasurer. That was their third organizational step. A treasurer, a secretary, a shopper. See what was happening? The gifts common to all humanity entrusted by their creator, those gifts were being pulled out. The gifts of accounting, the gifts of note taking, the gifts of responsible shopping. Those are all coming to the service. And so things start to change. There's a sense of ownership. There's, there's some well-being. I, I, I own this little co-op. I'm a, I'm a dues-paying member of this little co-op. Of course, the, the subject of food was on everybody's mind. And uh, there was, one of the conversations was about Mabel's sweet potato pie and one of her neighbors said if you if you folks ever tasted her pie I said my gosh she said it's to die for 
And so they, they kind of said, Mabel, why don't you bring us in a pie on our food day? And so she finally agreed to it. So, so she brought in a couple of pies for folks in her in the little co-op. And, and uh, they oohed and awed. And uh, then somebody else suggested one of their culinary treats. And before long, folks were bringing in, fixing food, bringing it in to the members of their co-op to sample. And then, and then a couple women said, would you be interested or would you be willing to let us use the church kitchen to fix meals for ourselves out of the food that we get from the food bank? And we said, yeah, sure, that'd be fine. And so they started with their culinary ability, started fixing food out of their, the, the proceeds that they brought back from the food bank and fixing hot meals for each other, which eliminated the, the necessity of the suburban churches that were bringing in hot meals to feed the poor of our community. They were feeding themselves. You see where that's going? When we start looking for the talents, the abilities that are there, and start facilitating the expression of those, m different things happen. It changes our, our paradigm of service. A couple of those women were talking one day and one of them said, you know, I've had, a, I've had a dream that all my life I've wanted to run a restaurant, have my own restaurant. Another woman said, you too? I've, had, I've, I've longed to have a restaurant. And so they went to uh, our pastor then in at l the little church and, and uh, they said, would, would, you, uh, would you help us start a restaurant? He said, I, I don't know anything about restaurants. He said, I know somebody that runs a restaurant. And uh, so he agreed to set up a meeting. And they, uh, this restaurateur told them how, uh, how very difficult it was to start and run a restaurant. It costs so much money. And the health department is on you all the time. And you, and, and you got food spoilage. And it's just, and it's very expensive. And, and those ladies were just undaunted. They said, would you help us figure out a, a budget if we go ahead with this? He said, well, we would. And so they came up with a, with a budget and came back to our pastor and said, uh, uh, would you help us uh, write some proposals to see if we could get money for this? And he said, well, he said he, he didn't know how to do that, but, but he knew somebody. And so they got together and, and uh, put a little budget and then a, kind of a mission statement together, a proposal, and uh, uh, raised the money to start a little restaurant. So when you come out of the Braves Stadium, if you're a Braves fan, and you probably wouldn't understand this, uh, you come out of the Braves Stadium and look across the parking lot, there's a little concrete block building painted bright yellow. And at the top it says, tummy and soul. And you can get some of the best down home cooking there that you'll ever curl a lip over. And on the tables in there are little, little uh, uh, paper, I don't know, little signs that say, tummy and soul, the outgrowth of the George Avenue food co-op. You, you see where I'm going with this? Talents, abilities, capacities, they're all there. But as long as we keep seeing folks as objects of pity, we just overlook those things. Well, um, I want to talk with you a little bit more about this, this. We've been talking kind of U.S. charity here, how we do it here in the States. I want to spend more time... Uh, this afternoon talking about uh, the way we do missions, our mission trips and that sort of thing. So I'll spend much more time with that. But there's one other area that, that uh, we probably should discuss and that is this, this idea of uh, service projects. Uh, I would guess that most of your churches are doing service projects of one sort or another. Would that be, would that be true? 
pretty popular. Service is very big in our culture and it's certainly big in the church. Uh, and, uh, and we have done uh, a lot of that. Uh, you know, when you're, you're planted in the inner city and you've got all kinds of uh, needs all around you, uh, volunteers become, they're your lifeblood. And, uh, and they bring resources and talents. And so uh, we love volunteers. So I was sitting on my porch one day with Virgil, my neighbor, across the street. We're sitting there talking. And a church van, 14 passenger church, church van, comes down the street real slow, slow past our house. And kids in there, it's a youth group, kids in there are waving and looking. And Virgil said, you know I hate it when those volunteers come down here. I said, really? I said, I thought you liked volunteers. They built your house. <laughs> and he said, oh yeah, he said, they, they do good, but, but he said, they insult you and they don't even know they're insulting you. And then he started telling me about volunteers that had been working in the community and, and one lady that was in their house uh, was going on and on about how neat and clean their house was. And he said, I know she meant well, but he says, he says, I know what was behind that. She was surprised that a black family living in the inner city wasn't living in a trashy hovel. He said, I know what was behind that. And one lady was was complimenting them on how well behaved and how smart their children were. He said, I, he said, I know what's behind that, that they think inner city kids are, are dumb and rowdy. He said, I just hate it. I said, should we just, should we just not do volunteer projects anymore? Should we just cut that out? He said, no. He said, he said, they do good. But he said, I'll tell you one thing, it would be a lot, a lot better if we were the ones selecting the projects and doing the inviting. He said, that'd be, that'd be a lot different. Write that down. Community initiated, community led, community managed. Write that down. So I'll tell you another thing. Uh, he said, uh, they come in here and they treat us like we're the, the least, the last, and the lost. He said, they have no idea how God is at work in our lives and in our community. They have no idea what it's like to live by faith in scarcity, where you have to trust God. When you say the Lord's Prayer about that part with give us this day our daily bread, that that's a heartfelt prayer of faith and you're trusting God to provide your need. They don't have a clue about the spiritual life that we have here in our walk with God. He said, it'd sure be a whole lot better if we, could, if we could share with them how God's at work in our lives. Write that down. Make sure we have plenty of time for good sharing. And so those became uh, some of the marching orders uh, for our volunteer service. Uh, we still have lots of volunteers, but the community invites them and the community sets up the project uh, and the community manages it. And we make sure that we have plenty of time for folks who don't struggle with poverty to learn how God is at work with those that do. There's, there is so much that, well, it, it'll mess with your theology is what it'll do. That it, serving among those in need, uh, it just, it, it'll turn your theology upside down. I... Uh, when we, we opened this little church up and one of the first people that came through the doors was, uh, was Miss Itson. Now she was a, uh, she was a great, great grandmother, lived 
lived with three generations of her family in a little shotgun house, you know, three rooms in a row, and they had to take shifts sleeping because there just wasn't, wasn't enough room. Uh, but for some reason, she just took a real affection to me. She, her son had, had her, her son who was a little younger than I had, had been, had been shot and killed in a taxi cab the Christmas before we moved in. And there, she showered that motherly affection on me. Now, Miss Itzen, um, she, had her, she had her physical issues. She, um, she had only one tooth left in her head. It was that eye tooth right there. And uh, she told me that she had dipped snuff ever since she was 14 years of age. And you know how old folks that uh, uh, don't have teeth to hold their, hold their lips out and get the creases in there, you know? And that, that tobacco juice is always working its way out those, those creases. She always wanted to kiss me. And her plumbing, uh, uh, her plumbing didn't work as well as it once did. So there was a, there was a kind of a rough aroma that, that followed her around. And she wanted to sit with me in church and hug me. And it's like uh, if you're working around like, like loud noises, after a while you just begin to tune them out. The same thing happens with, with aromas. Uh, she kept giving me subtle hints like, ooh, I'll bet you're going to have something good for lunch today, aren't you? And uh, what are you going to have today? What are you all eating today? And when, when are you going to invite me over to your house for a meal? And then, can I come over to your house after church today for a meal? Now, I'm trained uh, as a psychologist to pick up verbal and nonverbal communications. <laughs> and so in about two years, I figured out <laughs> that this woman was serious about coming to our house. And we had a discussion around our, our dining room table one Sunday. Why is it that we're so resistant to having Miss Itzen come to our house? And, uh, you know, the kids were talking. And I said, I said, personally, I, one of my big concerns is that she may, she may want to sit in my corduroy recliner, and, and it just wouldn't be the same again. <laughs> and it was in that discussion that, that the Spirit of God shined a light down into the darkness of, of a theology that I was calling good stewardship. Good stewardship, that is you take good care of the things God has entrusted to you. Get long life out of it, that's good stewardship. Learned that from the time I was just little. Take those dirty shoes off before you come in this house. Don't sit on that couch with those dirty clothes. That's good stewardship. And, and Miss Itzen, unbeknownst to her, was like the voice of Christ saying, Bob, I know you're a hopeless materialist, but can I sit in your chair? and exposing what I was calling good stewardship for just what it really was. It's just plain old materialism. I'd taken full ownership of that stuff, and I didn't want it messed with. Well, when you, when you receive light, you, you got to walk in it. And so the next Sunday, we invited Miss Itzen to come to our home. And she did it exactly what I feared she would do. Uh, right straight for that corduroy recliner. And, uh, and then she joined a Bible study in our home, and every Tuesday night she would come, and nobody would sit in what they called, that's Miss Itson's chair. <laughs> that's Jesus saying, can I sit in your chair, Bob? And it never was the same. My kids will still tell you to this day one of their the humorous pictures that they see in their mind as a little kid growing up is a homeless guy with that chair up over his head walking down the street, taking that chair somewhere. <laughs> Turns your theology upside down. Correctives in your theology. 
the guy, uh, Raymond, Raymond's probably my age, Raymond's 70. And, when he, and he was homeless and looked really old when we moved into the community 35 years ago. And I don't know why Raymond isn't dead today. He should be. His, you know, he's got an eye gouged out, and he just, he, he just lives out in the open. Raymond would come to the lunches that we had at the church. Raymond was a good worker, but his alcoholism uh, didn't allow him to keep a job, and so... I'd put him to work when I could. We were up on, uh, on the church roof one day, mopping tar, fixing a leak. And Raymond, Raymond said to me, he leaned on his mop, and he said, you know, Bob, I ain't no Christian, but I love my Jesus. What do you do with that? He's saying, I can't live the Christian life. I'm, I'm broken. Can't be delivered from this alcoholism. I, I just ain't no Christian. But when Raymond would be rousted by the cops and take down to jail and nobody to go his bail, when he's sleeping cold in the park by himself, when there was nobody else in his life to call friend, he had one one person, one relationship, and that was his Jesus. Jesus who said, I'll never leave you. Jesus that is, that is identifying with the broken, the most broken of our world. A Jesus that I never knew. I knew the Jesus of the abundant Christian life. I just never knew the Jesus who would never leave the most broken people in our world. Well, that's theology that somehow comes out of unlikely, unsuspecting places. So then the question is, how do we look for that? How do we stay open for that? How do we look for the potential that's there? I didn't go into the city expecting somebody to teach me theology. But somehow God, the Spirit of God, is at work in the lives of people and it, and it changes us. Well, uh, let me hasten to wrap this part up. There is a, uh, in the medical profession, uh, there is a code of conduct, uh, conduct for physicians. They call it the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, it was uh, developed by... Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, back before the time of Christ. And he realized that physicians could, could play God. And he said, we, we really need a, an ethical code uh, that we subscribe to that, that gives us some parameters for our, our medical practices. And so he developed the Hippocratic Oath, which doctors to this day still take. I've thought, why in the world don't we as uh, compassionate servers, folks who do ministry, uh, why don't we have a code like that? So I started, I started to give it a little uh, shot. And so here's what I call our uh, code for helpers. Number one, I'll never do for others what they have the capacity to do for themselves. That was our, that was our golden rule become our golden rule. If I, do, if I don't do that, if I, if I do for others what they can do for themselves, then I, then I take power away from them. I, I subtly communicate to them, you don't have anything that I need in return here. Be, be satisfied with my charity. Promote a, a kind of a spirit of beggary that is unhealthy for giver and recipient. So that's, that's number one of our code. Number two, I'll limit my one-way giving to true crises. And we know what that is. Somebody's house gets burnt out. Uh, a, a tornado comes across. We know when there's a real crisis. 
most of what we see is a function of chronic need. I'll, I'll limit my one-way giving to real emergencies, and I'll always look for ways to develop exchange with people, legitimate exchange. Three, I'll, I'll uh, empower people through, through hiring, through lending, through investing. And I'll use those, those grants to reinforce achievements as opposed to giving folks dependency producing gifts. And so hiring folks uh, is, is dignity producing. When Michael comes to my house and he says, Bob, can I have 20 bucks? And I'll say, can you wash the van? Michael does a good job washing the van. And I'll give him 20 bucks. And, and whatever Michael does with that 20 bucks is totally his responsibility. He has earned it. It's his. He's responsible for doing with it what he wills. And he may, he may use it to get high or he may not. But it's a legitimate legitimate exchange. I'll put the interests of the poor above my own interests or my own organizational interests, even if it means setting aside my own agenda. Um, we end up doing a lot of make work, uh, particularly on mission trips. Uh, and, and mostly that's to make us feel useful and uh, uh, that this is a meaningful work experience. I remember uh, one of our staff girls just came back from a, a, an international education conference. And, and during one of the breakouts, the, uh, she was sitting around with some other educators. And uh, they got to talking about, uh, about volunteerism and, uh, and mission trips. And one of the black educators there said, you know, I could never figure out why you Americans love to paint so much. <laughs> she said, in my village, whenever the Americans were coming, they'd let us out of school early and tell us to go out and get, uh, get uh, mud and dust and, and trash up the outside of the school because the Americans need something to paint. He said, the three years I was in that school, that whole school had been painted over four different times. He says, what is about you Americans? Just love to paint. What is our service and what is our mission trip? What's that about? Is that, a, is that about us? Is that about running good volunteer programs? Is that about making us feel significant? Or is it about really transforming the lives of those we say we're going to serve? setting aside our, our own agendas for the sake of those we would serve. And then uh, I'll listen carefully to both the spoken and unspoken communication of those I serve because I know that an awful lot of needs are really unspoken. There's uh, a group recently came back from Haiti and... Uh, in one, in one small village, uh, the women noticed mothers holding their infants that were wrapped in uh, old newspaper and dirty rags, and their hearts were just touched. And so the, the following day, they went into the city, and they, they bought up a bunch of, of new blankets and passed those blankets out to those moms so that they could have something clean to wrap their babies in. But the following day when they came back, all those blankets were in the little, sh little shops along the street. Those women had sold those blankets. And the women, they were, uh, they were incensed until our staff guy on the ground said, you know, they sold those blankets to get money to buy food for their babies. The, the real need is food. Unspoken needs that were there that you just wouldn't know unless you listened really carefully and long enough to hear real needs. And then the last one 
is uh, the same as the Hippocratic Oath, word for word. Above all, to the best of my ability, I will do no harm. I think that's a, I think that's a good motto for those of us that would serve. Well, let me stop there and see if there are questions, comments, reactions. We've got a, we've got a ro roving mic somewhere around here. These are probably live. Can I have some help with the mics? Um, I've, I've talked a lot here. I may, have, I may have tramped on some toes. I don't know. But uh, let's give, we got about 15 minutes for some, some interaction here. So uh, comments, questions, reaction, pushback. Uh, I like vigorous interaction. Who's got one? Talk real loud too, because yes, I, yeah, I can't hear. I very was well. interested in the um, the food co-op idea, and how did you generate interest? Did you invite the clients that um, that come to your pantry to a meeting, or how did you actually start that idea going? The co-op, you get that. The food co-op. How did we start it? Well, uh, a guy on our staff said. Uh, explain what this, you know, the basic idea of putting money in and, and expanding your food dollar pretty dramatically. Uh, so yeah, there was just a, a little organizational meeting, a dozen women, they put their three dollars in and brought food back uh, that that, th what, 36 bucks and some food pantry money. And they were, they were pretty amazed, the amount of food that they got. Uh, we never did close down the food pantry. So we kept the food pantry going, but the co-op continued to grow. And finally, the co-op outgrew our space. We just didn't have room for all the people and, and all the food. And so we had to kind of subdivide we figured out that 50 households, 50 members, uh, was about optimal. That number would work pretty well. And after that, then we start, an, start another one. And so today, we have six different co-ops, all with 50 members, 50 households each. And so that's, if you figure five per household, that's a lot of mouths being fed. One of the issues, of course, is that with food banks, they've got uh, certain regulations. They'll get government, subsidy, gov government surplus, that sort of thing. Uh, they are, uh, they've got rules about selling the food. You can't, you can't sell that food. And so we had to figure out ways that we could honor those rules, but at the same time have members with a sense of ownership. So you can't put money in to buy food directly, uh, an individual can't buy food directly from the food bank, but individuals can make a contribution to your church. And so that money can flow through the church. The church can buy the food. And so it's a little bit of, uh, I would say, creative uh, laundering, if you will. Uh, it, would be, uh, it would be one of those examples of when Jesus said, be as sneaky as snakes, <laughs> but as harmless as doves. I think that's one of those. Uh, but the, the guy that runs the food bank loves our food co-op program, and he wants to encourage everybody to do that. And so he's willing to do that. Do it. It's a little dance. Uh, to protect the legitimacy and the rules of the food bank and the government, don't violate that, but on the same hand, enable folks to take much more control of their, of their own lives and have the, have the dignity of essentially having their own, their own operation. Uh, and, and frankly, those little co-ops have become church for a lot of folks. You know how uh, we have a hard time getting the poor to feel comfortable in our churches? You know how that is? We want to invite them and our hearts are good, but the culture is so different. And so it, it just doesn't work very often to have 
a bunch of poor people in our congregation. We have found that co-op members, first of all, there's spiritual gifts among the co-op. And there's somebody that knows the Bible very well. And there's somebody that's willing to say, let's, uh, let's open in prayer. And when somebody can't get in because they're sick this week, uh, then let's, let's deliver food to them. There's outreach going on. And so uh, there's prayer for each other. They start, dev- they, they start having devotionals. And I mean, the spirit of God works among, among people. And in our culture, just because you're poor doesn't, doesn't mean uh, you don't have good faith. And so to facilitate that, encourage the expression of faith. And so those little groups have become, uh, they've become like church to folks. They belong to that. They won't miss their, their Wednesday lunch and food distribution day together. And we have, we have a couple of the co-ops in uh, senior high rise. And boy, that's just like church for them. They won't miss that. So when I come, it put, the co-ops put our food pantry out of business. Uh, Almost nobody uses the food pantry anymore. Every once in a while, somebody will, you know, have a a unique need. But the food co-op idea was so much more, I don't know, dignifying, affirming to one's spirit, but that's what folks said they wanted to be a part of. So we hardly give any food out of the food pantry anymore. But we didn't have a conflict between, you know, the folks that are running the food pantry, you're wrong and we gotta do it this way. We didn't have that at all. It was a, it was a shift of a paradigm where we grew up a new paradigm alongside of, of one that was, uh, that showed a better way, that's all. Did that answer your question? Sort of. We got one of the guys that runs our food co-op would be glad. They would love to talk with you about this. And he's got a video and he loves to talk with churches about starting these things. So uh, I'll be glad to give you contact information. Yeah. There's, a, there's one back, there, one up here. All right. Who's got uh, it? Okay. Uh, all right. I, I just have a quick question about the uh, Christmas gifts. Yes. Um, what do you do in the case of a situation where you have parents that really could care less whether their children get Christmas gifts or not? They are in a life situation, a psychological situation, or whatever. Um, and so, you know, as a ministry of the church, you care about those children and you want to reach out to those children. You know, I just, in, you know, the dynamics of working in the community and finding uh, parents that uh, just don't have that typical love for a child. Um, and uh, so just want to see if you ran into that, or how you might have handled that situation uh, in the community and really overall. I mean, when you find uh, parents that really are not caring for their children. Uh, I, I have, uh, I cannot think of one parent in 40 years that fits that description. I don't know of a single parent that doesn't at some level love their kids and want to do something for them. And dads that are absent all year long will tend to show up at Christmas time to do something for their kids. Uh, and so now, now I know some very broken parents. I know, I know some very, very ineffective parents and parents that are strung out on alcohol and drugs. So uh, I, I know a lot of, uh, I've seen a lot of brokenness. But I'll tell you what, there's something down deep in a parent's soul that says, I want, I want good for my kids. It's, uh, I think it's a part of the divine imprint on us. And so we assume that every parent wants something good for their kids. And so we say, let's make it let's make it feasible for them to express that love for their kids. Uh, there, you know, if we're not involved with them, because we were in the community, we could, you know, you could have more relationships with people, which is different from strangers coming to the church. And you gotta make a decision, is this, 
is this need really legitimate or not? You know, don't really know them, and you can't, it's hard, to, it's hard to do due diligence to find out. You don't know if you're hearing a whole story. It's, it's different when you are a part of a community in a neighborhood where you start to know people or somebody knows somebody else or somebody knows. You can get intelligence on folks. Uh, now, here's what I have seen a good bit. I have seen entrepreneurial, mostly moms, I have seen entrepreneurial moms who figure out how to get masses of toys at Christmas time uh, through your church and your church and, uh, and United Way's deal and Toys for Tots and Angel Tree. They know, work through the system. Those are some entrepreneurial people. And I've been in homes that were absolutely almost loaded to ceiling with toys. Uh, many, many more than their kids could ever use. So I've seen that. Uh, but, but the idea that we have to take care of other people's kids, I, 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 know that, I know that our heart responds when we see a child that's in need, but you know what that child needs more than anything else? is to feel the love of a parent. That's what they need. And so we want to work on that end of it, how to, how to strengthen parents. Uh, and again, this, this goes to another theology here that, that has, you know, it's, my theology is just all, all messed up. Uh, when I see a mom that's strung out on drugs and she's, she's, trying to keep her baby out of child protective services. She's doing her best. She's losing the battle, but she's doing her best to keep her baby out of the system. My response to that woman is, how pleasing that is to God. You are doing what God has placed in your heart to do, to love that baby. And that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. I know you're struggling, and I know, I know you lose those battles, but God is so pleased when he sees you loving your child. That's, a, that's not a saved, lost theology that I grew up with. That's a, that's a creation theology that says we're all created in the image of God. And we're all, we have, we have, something in us to, that, that, that wants to be all that we've been created to be. So it just, you know, it messes with your theology. But to your point, uh, we want to do all we can to strengthen the hands of parents. Because that's what those kids need more than, our, more than a stranger's love. We've got one more question in the back there. And then we've got one up here. If we don't get to this one before the break, we're going to ask you. Okay, so, uh, Vito? Yes, uh, would you address the interaction or the dynamic involved with the, what you're doing and in, in you're working with individuals that are already in dependency based on government things they get, whether it's food stamps or TANF or disability? Oh, uh, you want to drag me into politics, don't you? <laughs> I, no, I, I, no don't know, solutions. I don't know, I don't know about Vito here. Vito's got an agenda, I think. <laughs> I'm just playing with you, man. Uh, our dependency systems have hurt our families in this country. That's just all there is to it. And the more of that we do, the, the deeper the dependency gets. You know, one in seven Americans are now receiving food stamps. That's just wrong. Uh, and those subsidies, those entitlements never go away, you know? It's like, you remember the Republicans have said, we're going we're gonna to cut food stamps? And you remember the reaction? That just happened last week. Remember the reaction? The heartless, capitalist, fascist Republicans want to cut food stamps. One in seven Americans are on them. So... Uh, much of that is a hunger, that, uh, much of that is a kind of an emergency response to a chronic need, and it ain't good. Now, now in a civilized society, we've got to have safety nets, no question about that. 
And so we don't have, in this country, we don't have a, star, we don't have a starvation problem. You know, starvation is a crisis, a crisis issue. Hunger, no, hunger is a chronic issue. And, uh, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of my neighbors, they've, you know, run out of food, they have to, have to eat peanut butter sandwiches, and I've seen guys going through dumpsters. I've seen mal, I've seen poor nutrition, uh, certainly seen obesity, uh, but I haven't seen starvation. Starvation's a crisis need. So those that struggle with food insecurity, that's, uh, th th those are folks that need development activities. That's the teach the man to fish part of that analogy. They need development help, not additional subsidies, not additional emergency responses. And so, I mean, I, know, I understand the book bag buddies where you feed kids on the weekend, take home the food. Uh, For the most part, that's an unaccountable system. It's not like teachers are picking this kid and this kid, and I know what that situation is, and, and we'll help them. Uh, we have no idea where that food goes to. And so it's a, it's a, it's a heart response to, to, a, to an anecdotal need that folks have come up with, you know? It, so, uh, you know, I guess I might seem a little hard-hearted hard on this, but I just, uh, I just see what it has done to uh, a culture of people. The neighbors that I have lived among, the dependency is just not good. It just hurts. It, 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 fosters, it fosters a kind of a beggary, and it's not healthy. So, uh, you know, elect me to office, right? <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not interested in politics. Uh, but uh, in prison, there are certain fundamental uh, safety nets that any civilized society should have. And, and one of those is health care, as far as I'm concerned. I don't know why we don't get that as a nation. Every, civil, every, every developed nation in the world gets it except us, so it looks like we're gonna get it. But uh, I see that as a basic human right, healthcare, just like education, basic human right. Oh. Oh. <laughs> right on. Uh, we are at that time. I, I have not forgotten about you. We're gonna get you after lunch. Um, and we might just start off. I'll, I'll ask you the question at lunch, and, and we'll figure out what we're, how we're going to plug we that in. Come on, let them have it. Can you give a short answer? Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> it, if you'll hold your answer to 60 seconds. My question is, how do you, um, or how have you gone about transforming mindsets of volunteers, nonprofits, and donors who want to just give, 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 and foster that dependence to shift to the, you know, kind of helping people become more empowered and independent? That's a, that's a really good question. I wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking to you. I, I really think that is the answer, is that, <laughs> is that um, Bob did write a book, and we're all sitting here today trying to learn and understand that. And it, now it's up to us. Uh, it's our message that we have to take back out. Um, my good friend Kenneth up here in front deals with that same thing nearly every single day, is how do we get people to change their mind? And it's through conversation. We've got to start telling people. We've got to start explaining this for people to get it. And if the second that we stop that, or that we don't, that we don't take that initiative, then it's on us. We own it. Um, it is five minutes after. We are going to do our best to still be back here at 11:45. Um, if you would just bow with me.